Our distant ancestors, watching the stars, noted five that did more than just rise and set in stolid procession as the so-called fixed stars did. These five had a curious and complex motion. Over the months, they seemed to wander slowly among the stars. Sometimes they did loops. Today, we call them planets, the Greek word for wanderers. It was, I imagine, a peculiarity our ancestors could relate to. We know now that the planets are not stars, but other worlds gravitationally lashed to the sun. Just as the exploration of the Earth was being completed, we began to recognize it as one world among an uncounted multitude of others, circling the sun or orbiting the other stars that make up the Milky Way galaxy. Our planet and our solar system are surrounded by a new world ocean, the depths of space. It is no more impassable than the last. Maybe it's a little early. Maybe the time is not quite yet. But those other worlds, promising untold opportunities, beckon. In the last few decades, the United States and the former Soviet Union have accomplished something stunning and historic. The close-up examination of all those points of light, from Mercury to Saturn, that moved our ancestors to wonder and to science. Since the advent of successful interplanetary flight in 1962, our machines have flown by, or orbited, or landed on more than 70 new worlds. We have wandered among the wanderers. We have found vast volcanic eminences that dwarf the highest mountain on Earth, ancient river valleys on two planets, enigmatically one too cold and the other too hot for running water. A giant planet with an interior of liquid metallic hydrogen into which a thousand Earths would fit, whole moons that have melted. A cloud-covered place with an atmosphere of corrosive acids where even the high plateaus are above the melting point of lead. Ancient surfaces on which a faithful record of the violent formation of the solar system is engraved. Refugee ice worlds from the trans-Plutonian depths exquisitely patterned ring systems marking the subtle harmonies of gravity and a world surrounded by clouds of complex organic molecules like those that in the earliest history of our planet led to the origin of life silently they orbit the sun waiting We have uncovered wonders undreamt by our ancestors who first speculated on the nature of those wandering lights in the night sky. We have proved the origins of our planet and ourselves by discovering what else is possible, by coming face to face with alternative fates of worlds more or less like our own. We have begun to better understand the Earth. Every one of those worlds is lovely and instructive. But so far as we know, they are also, every one of them, desolate and barren. Out there, there are no better places, so far at least. During the Viking robotic missions, beginning in July 1976, in a certain sense, I spent a year on Mars. I examined the boulders and sand dunes, the sky red even at high noon, the ancient river valleys, the soaring volcanic mountains, the fierce wind erosion, the laminated polar terrain, the two dark potato-shaped moons. But there was no life, not a cricket or a blade of grass or even so far as we can tell for sure, a microbe. Life is a comparative rarity. You can survey dozens of worlds and find that in only one of them does life arise and evolve and persist.
having in all their lives till then crossed nothing wider than a river. Laib and Chaya graduated to crossing oceans. They had one great advantage. On the other side of the waters there would be, invested with outlandish customs, it's true, other human beings, speaking their language and sharing at least some of their values, even people to whom they were closely related. In our time, we've crossed the solar system and sent four ships to the stars. Neptune lies a million times further from Earth than New York City is from the banks of the river Bug. But there are no distant relatives, no humans, and apparently no life waiting for us on those other worlds. No letters conveyed by recent emigres help us to understand the new land. Only digital data transmitted at the speed of light by unfeeling, precise robot emissaries. They tell us that these new worlds are not much like home, but we continue to search for inhabitants. We can't help it. Life looks for life. No one on Earth, not the richest among us, can afford the passage. So we can't pick up and leave from Mars or Titan on a whim or because we're bored or out of work or drafted into the army or oppressed or because justly or unjustly we've been accused of a crime. There does not seem to be sufficient short-term profit to motivate private industry. If we humans ever go to those worlds, then it will be because a nation or a consortium of them believes it to be to its advantage or to the advantage of the human species. Just now, there are a great many matters that are pressing in on us that compete for the money it takes to send people to other worlds. Should we solve those problems first? Or are they a reason for going? makers knew we're children equally of the earth and the sky. In our tenure on this planet, we've accumulated dangerous evolutionary baggage, propensities for aggression and ritual, submission to leaders, hostility to outsiders, all of which puts our survival in some doubt. But we've also acquired compassion for others, love for our children, a desire to learn from history and experience, and a great soaring passionate intelligence, the clear tools for our continued survival and prosperity. Which aspects of our nature will prevail is uncertain, particularly when our visions and prospects are bound to one small part of the small planet Earth. But up there in the cosmos, an inescapable perspective awaits. National boundaries are not evident when we view the Earth from space. Fanatic ethnic or religious or national identifications are a little difficult to support when we see our planet as a fragile blue crescent fading to become an inconspicuous point of light against the bastion and citadel of the stars.